This morning, uh, we're again returning to uh, Mark's Gospel. I don't think we've actually left it yet, except just on occasion. But uh, we've cleared the Olivet Discourse, and now we're moving into chapter 14 as we're looking, as it were, down the final <coughs> few days of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth. And um, the first section might um, typically be something that we've, we've heard so many times we might just pass over, but I, um, I, I wanted to, um, to have us meditate on this particular section, these two verses, because I think there is an important lesson for us to learn here, uh, to be reminded of, uh, something the Lord calls us to do that I think many times we're not willing to do, but we must be if we're going to follow Him. Let's uh, read Mark 14, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, I've already mentioned that we are in the, just really the last few days of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth before his crucifixion, not counting the 40 days, of course, that he appeared after his uh, resurrection. Uh, we see that they're only two days away from a couple of very important feasts, feasts that our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill, Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread. Now we read in our text here that um, the leaders of Israel were not so much thinking about the feast and how they might glorify God in it, Rather, they had their minds focused upon Jesus Christ and not how they might serve him, honor him, receive him, love him, but rather how they might kill him. Their only concern was that it not be during the feast so that the people wouldn't see what they were doing and tend or be tempted to riot, of course, which at that point they would. Now, again, we might have passed over these comments. We do need to see there's a very important lesson here. And I want to draw your attention to the simple point that this passage is making. And yet, one that should shock us, but doesn't shock us anymore because we've seen it so much. And that is that these leaders of Israel, and again, these weren't, these weren't the, uh, the rulers of the world. These were not you know, the leaders of Rome and so forth, the world power at that time. These were the leaders of the church. They were looking at Jesus. They hated Jesus, and they wanted to kill him. Now, again, its shock value isn't what it used to be, but we do need to see something of what it is that um, Mark is recording for us here. I mean, think about your attitude toward Jesus Christ. I mean, what do you think of him? To you, isn't he the one that you love the most? Don't you see in him perfection, uh, perfect righteousness, perfect truth, perfect love? I mean, isn't he the one who came into the world actually to lay down his life for you because of his infinite love for the Father and for you? Isn't he perfect love itself? The one that you love so much that you would be willing to die for rather than that he should die for you, which he did. This is the one that they wanted to kill. This is the one whom they hated. Now, how can this be? I mean, why is it like this? Well, I want us to consider this, of course, briefly this morning, but I do want us to focus a little bit on the application of this text because let's not forget that our Lord Jesus Christ uh, calls us to be like him. And if we are going to be like him, then we are going to be hated by the world in the same way that Jesus Christ was hated by the world. Now, I, I, I hope that uh, in our meditation and our dwelling on this this morning that we're going to see perhaps some things that we haven't seen before, maybe have a new lens through which we can examine our lives and see whether or not we're actually living like Jesus Christ so as to draw this kind of attention from the world to us. Now, first of all, I want us to consider what the problem was, why it is they hated Jesus Christ. To take a life is a very serious thing. And the Bible says to want to take a life is almost as bad, although not quite as bad. 
these leaders of Israel wanted to kill Jesus Christ. If it was in their power, they, they would do so. Now, why did they want to do this? Well, there might be some things that the world would look at and see on the surface. I mean, Jesus was rubbing them the wrong way. I mean, they didn't agree with Jesus on a number of issues. And you know, when you don't agree with someone, it makes you kind of not like them. And when you don't agree on religious issues, which are particularly sensitive ones, then you get even more uh, rackled, as it were, more riled in your spirit. You know, there's two things that people say you should never talk about. One is politics and the other is religion because it raises your ire so quickly because of the divergence of opinions. Well, Jesus didn't agree with them and they were angry at him because of that disagreement. They were also angry at Jesus because he was often pointing out their hypocrisy. People hate to have their flaws pointed out, especially in public, which our Lord Jesus Christ did on some occasions. They also hated Jesus because if the people of Israel, if their, their people continued to follow Jesus Christ, then Rome would eventually see that there's this other king that is, uh, well, as it were, uh, competing with Caesar, and they would come in and take away their place. You know, people hate to give up power. They hate to give up any advantage that they might have. And I'm sure that these things fed into their hatred of Jesus Christ. What was the real reason they hated him? Well, the real reason is because Jesus is holy and they are not holy. Their hearts were full of sin. They actually hated, by the way, this description of them is the same description of those who are in the world. They hate what is right. They love what is wrong. Now, it may seem like they do like what's, what's good and what's right. They do when it benefits them, but when it costs them something, when it gets in their way, it has to go. That's the way it is in the world. That's the way they came into the world. That's what's, what Adam's sin did to them. It not only made them guilty, as it made us guilty, guilty enough to go into hell forever, but it also made them sinful gave them a taste, a desire for sin, and a hatred of what is right. Consequently, they loved darkness and hated light. That's the way the world is. By the way, that's the way we were when we came into the world. That's the way we were when Jesus Christ met us. He's the one who changed our hearts and turned that around. However, we still have something of that darkness still in us, and so in some ways we are still like this. We need to guard ourselves against it. But Jesus, on the other hand, is holy. He is really the epitome of that light that the world hates. He is the one who is truth. He is the one who is perfect. He is the one who did everything right. He's the one who thought everything right who wanted everything right, he is the one who has a perfect love of what is right. I mean, he is perfect love, love incarnate. But you see, this made him so unlike them that they hated him. They hated him for wanting what was right. They hated him for saying what was right and doing what was right. Jesus said on one occasion, they hated me without a cause. You see, Jesus never did anything at all that was wrong, and yet they hated him for it. He says on another occasion, this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Well, they hated that light so much for the exposing of their darkness and their sins that they wanted to kill him. And again, let me just point out what I've already said before. Remember who these people were. Jesus is not speaking here about just the world. He's speaking about those who were in his church, those who were the leaders of his church. John writes in John 1.11, he came to his own 
and his own did not receive him. Are there people like this in the church today? You better believe that there are people like this in the church today. Being in the church does not necessarily mean that the Lord has changed your heart. Being in the church doesn't mean that you're a true believer, that you're a Christian. You should never rely on the fact that you have been baptized or that you've made some kind of profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your assurance of heaven because you can do that. You can be in the church and you can still be unconverted just like these leaders of Israel were. You should not trust in anything less than really what that hymn we, we sang a little bit earlier is really pointing to, not water baptism, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit which alone can change your heart. How do you know you have that? It's because you trust Jesus Christ and you live as he lived. You love as he loves in such a way that it draws the attention of those who don't love him toward you so that they hate you. Now this brings us to the second point. We understand that they hated Jesus Christ and we understand why they hated Jesus Christ, but the second point is an application of and that is simply if, if they hated Jesus because of what he was like, and the Lord calls you to be like Jesus, well, the world's going to hate you as well. Now, again, Jesus, in, in this particular text in John 15, verses 18 through 19, which was our meditation, was talking about the world. The world is going to hate you. Christians shouldn't hate you, but the world will hate you. Now, again, these leaders were in the church, but they were still a part of the world. If you are a Christian, if you are like Jesus Christ, and by the way, that's what Christian means. It doesn't mean I professed him. It means that I am like him. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, and they were called Christians because the people who saw them saw in them Christ. These, these people are living like Jesus lived, so they called him by that name. But if you are at all like him, then you are going to be hated like Jesus was hated. You're going to be hated by the world. You're going to be hated by those who are in the church who are still in the world. Again, Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. See, here's really one test by which you can tell whether or not you're living like Jesus Christ. When I'm around the world, does the world love me or hate me? Well, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I should find persecution. I should find opposition. I should find hatred by the world because the world hates Jesus Christ. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, did he say that some who desire to live godly or just a few who desire to live godly will be persecuted? No, he says all will. If you live like Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted like Jesus Christ. But again, you have to live like Jesus in order for this to happen because they only hate those who are like him. They only hate those who are godly. So that to the degree that you are like him, to that degree, you are going to suffer. You are going to be persecuted. Now, it almost sounds like I'm, you know, encouraging you to invite persecution into your life. Is that what I'm saying? Yes? Because persecution is not a bad thing. You know, should we avoid being like Jesus Christ so that we can avoid suffering? No, the Bible tells us to do just the opposite. Be like him and be willing to suffer in his name. Why? Well, because that's what gives glory to God. And also, that is what increases your rewards, not only on earth, but also in heaven. Jesus says in Matthew 5, again, verses 10 through 12, we read this in the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
when people insult you and persecute you and say and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, you, when you read this, you might, also, might almost be tempted to say that Jesus was saying this is a special class of people. A blessed are you when this happens to you. It may not happen to you, but if it does, then you're blessed. No, Jesus is telling us here that it's those who possess the kingdom of heaven who are going to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. It's those who are like him, and by the way, all Christians are like him, who are going to be insulted, persecuted, and have all kinds of things, things you know, said falsely against them. They are the ones who are going to be hated, and that's going to be true of everyone who is like Jesus Christ. So why should we want to, um, to invite persecution? Well, again, we don't want to necessarily invite it. We're not saying do, do whatever you can to get people to hate you. But you do need to live like Jesus Christ. So why should you live like him? Well, because it glorifies God, because it certainly increases your reward in heaven, but also because it is the mark that you are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. If you are not hated and persecuted in some degree by the world, then you are not like Jesus Christ because Jesus was hated by the world. If you're going to be like him, you are going to be hated as he was hated. Maybe not to the same degree because his light's a lot brighter than our light, but you still will be hated. So in our remaining time, let's consider how we can be more like Jesus Christ. I hope you're convinced that you need to be like him. Well, first of all, certainly you can use the means of grace. That's something that we have emphasized again and again and again. We've talked so much about it that I don't want to spend any time except just to remind you that that's what you need to do. Okay? The more you use the means of grace, the more you're going to be like Jesus Christ. The more you're going to have direction on exactly what he is like. I mean, who is Jesus? What is he like? The only way you can find out is by reading the Bible. And how can you do what the Bible actually tells you to do? I mean, how can you be like Jesus? Well, you need to pray. And you need to gain strength by the Holy Spirit. You need direction and you need power. And that's exactly what the means of grace, all the means of grace will give to you. So use the means of grace. But secondly, you need to purpose to live like Jesus. You need to use what you know the Bible. You need to uh, apply the Ten Commandments. You need to look at all the explanations and applications of the commandments throughout Scripture that Jesus and the apostles gave, and you need to put those things into practice. Now, here's one little, um, one little tip, <laughs> which is actually something that is the thrust of the Bible, but sometimes I think we miss this, that might be able to help you in this regard. Whenever you're faced with a choice, you know, a choice to do anything, whether it seems to be morally indifferent or whether it is a moral choice, okay? Put Jesus in your place and do what you know he would do if he were in your place. Now, I think it may <clears throat> often be the case, and I know that because I know myself. You know, the Puritans used to say that if you want to be a great preacher, know the Bible, but know yourself. And why should you know yourself? Well, because we are all the same. We all have the same temptations. We all go through exactly the same thing. No temptation is overtaking you, Paul said, but such is common to man. It's common to every single one of us. But what do we often do when we are faced with choices? Well, I think we allow ourselves to do things that Jesus would never do. And I think we believe when we put ourselves in that situation that it's okay. I can do that. I can live that way. I've got justification from Scripture that, that this is okay. God's going to accept this. He's not, he's not going to reject this. He's not going to call this sin. Now, we might be able to do that when we're in that spot. But put Jesus 
in the same place? And can you say the same thing? Would Jesus do that? Can you see him doing what you do? Can you see him not doing the things you don't do? Can you imagine him thinking what you're thinking? Or wanting what it is that you want? Or spending time the way that you spend it? Now, if you put Jesus in your place and you say, I really can't see him doing these particular things, then you need to reevaluate what it is you're doing. The Bible calls you to live like Jesus Christ, which means the things you do are the things he should be able to do. And if you're not doing the things that he would do, then can you really say you're living like a Christian? And if you're not living like a Christian, is it any wonder the world isn't perhaps on your case more than it is? Now, I think if we thought more about what Jesus would do if he were in our place and less about what we want to do in our place, I think it would change the way we live. Now, here's a few things we can perhaps apply. What would Jesus do if he knew that his people were gathering together on a Lord's Day morning to worship him? What would he do? What would he do if he knew those people were gathering together again in the evening to worship the Father? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do if the church met during the midweek and, and was studying the Bible or studying other things that helped us apply biblical principles and then were seeking the Lord in prayer? What would Jesus do? Again, would he stay at home? Would he go out where his people are meeting? And would he seek the Lord? What would Jesus do in order to support the work of the kingdom of heaven? What would he do with regard to ministering to the people of God? What would he do with those outside the church as far as helping them find eternal life through the gospel? What would he do to support the church financially? What would he say about other people? What would he think about them? How would he treat them? See, I, I think that you can see that if you ask the question in this way, if you put Jesus Christ in your place, that it may have the effect of changing a lot of what you do. Because it's easy to see yourself making these choices. We excuse ourselves, well, I'm just a sinful human being. I know I've got these temptations, and I'm going to give in to them, and the Lord's going to forgive me. But if Jesus were in your place, would he think that way? Would he live that way? Would he do those things? Would he have those priorities and the commitments that you have? Or would he have other commitments? Now, again, I recognize that we can't be like Jesus in absolutely everything. If that were the case, we'd probably hit the road, you know, get a few people to go with us, and maybe we'd uh, start preaching wherever we went. And that isn't necessarily what the Lord has called you to do, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying put yourself in Jesus' place and try to live what, how Jesus would live. What I'm saying is put Jesus in your place, in your circumstance, in your marriage, if you're married, or... Uh, in your family, uh, it, you know, whatever family you have, whatever relationship you happen to have, and in your workplace, uh, with the decisions that you have to make, and you decide what Jesus would do if he were in your place, because that is going to be the right choice, and that's the way we need to think. That's the way we need to behave. Whenever you're tempted to give in to sin, think about what would Jesus do if he were in your place? Well, he wouldn't give in to sin. What would he do instead? Well, he would do those things that would help him fight against that sin. Think like Jesus would think. Now, this, of course, means that you have the right understanding of who Jesus Christ is. If you don't, you need to read the Bible more, and you need to get to know him. He is a real person, but that real person is in heaven right now, and he is ruling and reigning over all things, and you can't just go into heaven and talk to him. If you're going to learn about him, you have to spend time in the means of grace. You have to read the Bible. Read it prayerfully. Find out what he's like. Find out what he would do. He basically fulfills the commandments of God. He is the epitome, the, the absolute perfect paradigm of, of what God calls us to be. So learn about Jesus Christ and seek to live like Jesus if he were living your life, even though it means, as we've already seen, that you're going to be hated by the world. 
God will give you the grace to do this. This is what he's called you to do. This is why he redeemed you. This is why he gave you the means of grace and the Holy Spirit is so you can be like his son, Jesus Christ. So he has given you the means. He's given you the grace. You need to be willing to do that. Well, may God grant that each of us would be by his grace. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply this to us.